Hello and welcome to this series on the book of Jude. The book of Jude is a small little book that carries a big punch in the New Testament. You're going to find it in your Bibles by turning to the very end of your Bible right here. It is right before the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the final book in the Bible. So just turn to the very back of your Bible. You will find Revelation there and then just go one book further back and you will find little bitty Jude. And this little bitty book of Jude, like I said, carries a big punch because although it's small, it's mighty, and it has a very vital message, both for its time and also for our time today. And that message is a call, an exhortation and instruction to fight for the faith. To fight for the faith because, you know what, whether you realize it or not, we're in a spiritual war. We are in a spiritual war. We have a very real enemy and his name is the devil. And we also have a very real enemy in sin and in a corrupt, fallen culture that's all around us. And this war is going to be fought in a way that maybe will surprise you. You will find that, yes, there is, when we think of spiritual conflict, spiritual warfare, we think of, you know, personal temptations and difficulties that are going on in our private lives. And that's true. That That's one of the dimensions of spiritual warfare. But an often underappreciated and kind of frighteningly neglected front in this war is the war upon the church itself. The church is the people of God coming together as the covenant people of God to do God's work. And therefore, obviously, our enemy wants to undermine and tear down the church. And by he does this by infiltrating the leadership of the church and attacking and undermining from that position the biblical authority and teachings, the foundations, if you will, of the church, of our faith. And he does this, as I said, by infiltrating the leadership of the church. And that is exactly what we see is happening in the book of Jude. The book of Jude is a letter, as you look down here in your Bible, it's just a really short letter written by a man named Jude. It's written to an anonymous church that we don't really know who they were, just that they were having some serious problems of false believers and heretics infiltrating their leadership. And a man named Jude, who is the brother of James, who is the brother of Jesus, and so therefore Jude is a brother of Jesus, and he being, you know, having seen that Jesus has risen from the dead, recognized that Jesus is the Lord and Savior of the world. He is God incarnate. He placed his faith in Jesus and is a follower of Jesus and a teacher. And he hears news that this church that we don't know much about is facing this problem. And so he urgently, very quickly sends off this little bitty letter to warn them and to give them some teaching instruction, not only to identify what a false teacher looks like, but some instruction for how and why they've got to take this seriously and to protect their church. And I want you to know that, yes, this may have been written many, many years ago, but it is certainly not a problem that is confined to the past. The church today is under attack. Right now in the United States of America, this spiritual war is in full swing. And I want to give you a heads up that it is not a war that's just kind of in the seminaries or as intellectual. It is in our very midst. And many denominations in the United States have already been undermined and collapsed. I want to give you a quick list off. I'm not wanting to give this list to act all high and mighty as if, you know, to look down on those who've been defeated, if you will. But I want to make you aware of the scale of the problem that has been going completely unopposed by many Christian laity. I want to make you aware here, I'm going to give you a list off of certain churches, denominations that have rejected the authority and inspiration and inerrancy of the Bible. 
the United Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, the United Church of Christ. All of these and many more reject the inerrant Word of God in its authority over our lives. That is a basic biblical foundation. If you want to know what a basic foundation of our faith is, it's this book. Without this, we're not the church. We're just a bunch of people giving our opinions. And in fact, that's what many of these denominations have been reduced to. If you really pay attention, they no longer teach the Bible. What they teach instead is a bunch of political talking points or pop psychology, and that is what they push trying to get people to come and sit in the pews and give them money. And once again, I'm not trying to be hateful, but I want to be honest because I want you to realize that this has real consequences. It's because of this that now we're seeing these denominations and many more absolutely reject biblical morality. Some examples I'm gonna list off particular and you can look this up for yourself if you want to. The Episcopal Church no longer accepts biblical morality. The Christian Church no longer accepts Biblical morality. The Evangelical Lutheran Church no longer accepts Biblical morality. They reject God's moral standards in the Bible about sexuality, about abortion, and so on and so forth. And these are not the only denominations. It is overwhelmingly throughout the church. And some people are shocked, but it all comes back to the fact that the Biblical foundations were undermined before. The reason we're even having a conversation in the church where some supposed pastors are coming out and saying, well, you know, abortion's not really wrong, or, well, you know, homosexuality's not wrong, or sex before marriage isn't wrong, so on, so forth. It's like, well, you know, you may think that's weird, and, you know, they say, wait a minute, but the Bible's already said clearly what is right and wrong. But you need to understand that many of these pastors are false teachers. They don't believe in this book at all. They don't believe in the authority of the Word of God. They, Many of them, I can tell you from experience, from when I was in seminary, are closet atheists. They won't ever admit that publicly, but they don't really believe in God at all. They just want to use the church as a way to enrich themselves. This is a serious problem. Before you think, oh, well, that, I'm not one of those denominations, it's not my problem. I want to tell you it is your problem. If you think this is a virus that is contained within just these denominations, you are fooling yourself. This is a real problem. It is affecting Baptist life and every denomination throughout the United States is being pressured within the seminaries, throughout the pastoral leadership to reject the Bible and to conform instead to some sort of a political or psychological format. I can confess in my own pastoral life, I face pressure to change what I believe and to stop teaching the Bible because I, uh, you know, that it doesn't fit in with the cultural acceptance of what some people want me to say. And I have been covertly threatened, if you will, to say, well, Eric, if you don't get on board with the program, you're going to regret it. We're, when we get power, we're going to punish you. Well, you know, I don't know what the future holds with that. But I want you to know that your pastor, wherever you're at, and my, your, if I'm your pastor, this is a reality that we're facing, and it's a problem that can only be solved if the people of God come together and fight for the faith. You have to fight for the faith. You have to stand for what's true. And the, that is the big message of Jude. We must fight for the faith. And I want you to know it's a fight we can win. By the power of God, we have the Holy Spirit. We have the Lord God Almighty on our side. We can prevail if we stand for the truth, if we are not cowards and run away, but we stand in love and grace, yes, but stand for truth, for what God has said. And to begin that fight, the first place we've got to fight to protect, that you have to fight to, to protect, are the biblical foundations, because that is where the attack will come. And that's what we see here in the book of Jude. In the book of Jude, and especially here in verses 1 through 10, Jude warns and exhorts his hearers, which includes you, to protect 
biblical foundations. Now, why should we protect biblical foundations at all? Well, Jude explains this, and the first reason of the three that he's going to give is that we must fight to protect biblical foundations because biblical foundations are being attacked. Let's look at that here in verses 1 through 4 together of the book of Jude. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's people. For certain individuals, whose condemnation was written about long ago, have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. You see here the warning of the biblical foundations are being attacked is because various false leaders have infiltrated the leadership of the church. You see that going back to verse 4, it says, Certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. Evil leaders, false teachers throughout church history, going back to the time of Jude and happens today, try to get into seminary, to get into pastoral leadership, and they try to hijack the church for their personal benefit. They will lie, they will scam, they will cheat. And this is because, whether they realize it or not, they are serving the interests of the father of lies himself. The Bible warns about this here in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 through 15. Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. So even the devil himself, when he tries to present himself to others, masquerades or pretends that he is an angel of light, meaning like, I'm, I'm one of the good guys, right? I'm one of you. But it's all so he can get inside. And he does the same thing through his agents, these false teachers. They get inside the church so that they can then get in and do sabotage to the church. Think of the dreadful damage that has been done to the testimony of the church and to the witness of the gospel by these televangelists on TV who go out there and scam thousands of people out of their money in the name of Jesus. It's all a lie. It's against everything the Bible says. But foolish people, desperate people are deceived by this and are taken advantage of by these false teachers. Friends, this is a real problem. It is a real problem. And the attacks that they do on the sabotage target two things in particular as are articulated here in our verses. Let's go back to the second half of verse 4 and let's see what they are sabotaging. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. Notice they are sabotaging two things, right? Number one, that they are perverting the grace of God. In other words, they're saying, well, God is all about love and forgiveness, and therefore I can do any old sin I want. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> it just certainly does. When people say, well, you know, God is love and grace, and therefore any condemnation of sin is wrong. And they like, you can't do that. But that's a perversion, isn't it? God is gracious and full of mercy and loves everyone, but sin is still bad. <laughs> You know what I mean? Sin is still evil. It is still wrong to commit sin. Hell is real. Jesus talked about hell more than he did about heaven. It is a real reality. And we are warned against the terrible consequences of sin. 
God has provided a way of forgiveness and escape, but sin is still a problem. But these false teachers will lie to you and say, oh, no, 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 you can just ignore all the rest of the Bible and I will just give you a couple of verses about God's love and grace and that's all that matters and I'll use that to justify my sin. That, that is the first way they attack but of course if they're going to do that they're going to go even deeper aren't they because you notice the second thing they attacked was what? They deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. They attack the authority of Jesus. Everyone if you remember of the denominations I listed and every false teacher, pastor I know will attack or ignore the authority of the Word of God and they will diminish the personhood of Jesus. They'll say Jesus is, you know, just a, you know, kind of like a guru or something, not that he is the Lord Almighty. They'll say that the Bible has some nice good stories, but they won't submit their own lives to it and obey it. They attack these basic foundations. That is the sabotage work that these false teachers seek to do. So what must you do to fight back against these guys? I urge you to hold all clergy, including me, especially me, hold all of us to the Bible. You must do that. That is something that you can, must do to protect the church and to preserve biblical foundations. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 1 verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Imagine that even the apostle Paul says, hey, even if I tell you something different, just ignore me. You must know this for yourself. You must know the Bible for yourself. You must know biblical truth for yourself. And that way, you don't just listen to what I say or anyone else say and say, well, the preacher said so, or, well, that sounds good to me. I'm not any great authority. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I am here to help you to understand the word of God, but I am no authority. The Bible is the authority, not me, not any other preacher, whether it be on TV or on the internet. Don't just take everything you hear and just say it's, well, it must be true. Hold everyone accountable to this book. And if any preacher, any pastor, any minister starts to say things and teach things and practice in their personal life, anything that's not in agreement with this book, turn away from them. If you can, just kick them out of the church. If you can't, then you leave that church and go to one where there is the authority of God is held up and the Bible is taught. You must hold the clergy accountable to our true leader of the church, which is Jesus Christ. That's what you must do. But we not only need to protect and stand up for biblical foundations because they're under attack, but friends, these biblical foundations are necessary. They are necessary. Look what we are warned about here in verses five through eight. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. You see, we are given right off of here as Jude has just given this warning that, hey, the foundations are under attack. He says, now listen, you need these foundations because you know what happens when you don't have them? Disaster strikes, right? And he gives three historical examples of people who rejected biblical foundations, the truth of God, and the disaster that followed. We saw there in verse 5, the rebellion of Israel, right? as it is recorded. I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, 
but later destroyed those who did not believe. Remember, God rescued his people from Israel. He got them out of slavery. But on the way to the promised land, they turned their backs on God, rejected him. And it led to that entire generation, all of them, except for Joshua and Caleb, all died in the wilderness. They never got to go and experience the promised land because they turned their backs on God. Rebellion leads to disaster. Rejecting God's authority leads to disaster. And then a second example is given, right? This second example is in verse six and it talks about the fallen angels. We call those demons, right? The angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for the judgment on the great day. These angels which rebelled against God's authority said, well, we don't want to do, you know, to be in paradise, right? We don't want to live in the glorious presence of God. And they came down here to earth to torment human beings. And for that, they have eternal judgment and punishment. They are confined in the prisons of God's wrath for all eternity. This rebellion of the fallen angels is judged and will be judged for all eternity. So how would we expect any different for us if we reject biblical foundations? It didn't work out so good for the demons, did it? It certainly didn't. It's not gonna work out great for us. And then of course, the third example is given, which is in verse seven, and it's Sodom and Gomorrah, as it is said here. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual morality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. If you remember the book of Genesis, it is recorded that these cities were incredibly corrupt and perverse, giving themselves over. Remember the main sins that are recorded there, of course, are homosexuality and rape, but there were other sins as well. And God just says, you know what, I'm done with this. And he only sends fire and brimstone and just and it's gone, right? Just whoop, wiped out. And you know what? That's, that's a warning to us, right? That they rejected biblical foundations in regards to morality and basic decency, right? And they just rejected all of that and it resulted in tragedy and disaster. Why would we think it'd be any different for us? It won't be. We need these biblical foundations. And that's what's exactly is in store for these evil false leaders that Jude is talking about here in verse eight. In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. In other words, these false teachers, they're just like the people, these you know, people who were judged by God, they're just like them. And so therefore, they're going to be to judge by God in the same way. So what is the application from that? Well, obviously, the application is don't follow them off the cliff, right? Don't go off the cliff with them. One of the big pressures that I face and you will face most likely if you take a stand for what God has said in this time and age for biblical foundations, you will be threatened. And the threat that is given to me quite frequently is this. If you don't get on board, then you will be defeated. It's the inevitable tide of history. If you don't reject the Bible, Eric, if you don't reject what God has said and you start you know, putting on more of a shindig to try and entertain people, well then, you know, you will be irrelevant. And you know, maybe I personally will be irrelevant. That's perfectly possible. But this is never irrelevant. I can be irrelevant and it really doesn't matter, <laughs> but this is never irrelevant. This is the truth of God. And it, without the Lord, without God's word, without the Holy Spirit living in us, without the shed blood of Jesus Christ, without the rule in our lives of God the Father, we are hopeless. We cannot win without him. So therefore, rather than get rid of the biblical foundations hoping to be relevant, we need to cling closer to the Lord, practice it ourselves, cling closer to Jesus. Remember what Jesus told us in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse five. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing.
So, so far, the things we need to do to fight for the faith to protect our biblical foundations is one, hold your clergy accountable to the Word of God, and second, Hold yourself accountable that you are practicing yourself the Word of God, putting into practice and serving Him so that you have the power of God working in your life. But there's a third thing here that is given to us by Jude. Not only do we fight for our biblical foundations because, well, they're under attack and, and because they're necessary, but because they will ultimately triumph. They will prevail. Let's read here verses 9 and 10. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. This is important because it reminds us that we fight in the power of Jesus. The Archangel Michael, who by the way, let's just be real here, way more powerful than me and you, right? This is an Archangel we're talking about. And this Archangel, when he faces against the devil as they're disputing about the body of Moses, the Archangel Gabriel you know, doesn't just draw his sword and say, Kami Kami Ha, you know, and smites the devil. It doesn't work that way. But rather, what does the Archangel Michael do? Which is an example to you and me. He says, the Lord rebuke you. Even the Archangel Michael must have the power of God to prevail. And he always prevails. God always prevails. The devil is not in this like deadlock battle with God. No, the devil is a rebel who is running away in his short time that he has that God's allotted until God puts him within the eternal fire of hell. In this short time, he's just a, a kid on the run waiting to get put to the woodshed. That's all he is. And so he cannot stand against God. He cannot oppose God. God will crush him. He is a defeated foe. And therefore, just like Michael, we must, in the power of God, resist the devil, resist sin, and stand on biblical foundations by standing in the power and authority of God. And this is in sharp contrast to these false leaders who want to tell the people in Jews time, who want to tell you that, well, the way to victory, if you want to be successful and have a big church and lots of people come, is to get rid of those more controversial things in the Bible and start saying things that are more politically cool or are more about pop psychology or have, you know, fog and, and special lights and stuff like that. What is the warning that's given to us here in the Bible about that in verse 10? These people slander whatever they do not understand and the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. Their own evil, the things that they naturally understand are is their own sin, their selfish desires, their, you know, when they exploit the laity, when they, you know, will embezzle or give or give in to their, you know, having multiple affairs and do all these horrible things that these false leaders inevitably always seem to do. They're undone and destroyed by their own evil. Friends, evil is not a path to victory. Rejecting God and serving the interests in, of the devil, if you will, is certainly not joining the winning team, if you know what I'm saying. The one who has triumphed is God. And therefore, if we remain faithful to him, don't become discouraged and deceived by the fact that maybe there are cultural trends that seem to say that people are more interested in sin than in goodness or more interested in listening to lies than in listening to God's truth. Don't be discouraged by that. But remember that those of us who remain true to Christ to the very end will prevail. This is the path to victory. The Bible gives us this promise in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 6 and 7. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. 
those who prevail, who go and, as Jesus beautifully describes here, and experience all the joys of the resurrection and of heaven are those who remain faithful to him. And that doesn't mean that we get everything right. We most certainly don't, you know, I'm a sinner, and so is everyone listening to this. We're all sinners, but we have an amazing Jesus. And if we remain faithful to him, stand for these biblical foundations, we shall prevail in the end. The good always triumphs. So please, friend, take this fight seriously. You are in a spiritual war, and right now in the United States, just like way back all those millennia ago, the church is under attack. And those specifically, that attack has begun and will continue on in our biblical foundations. And so I challenge you one last time, please hold your clergy accountable to the word of God. You need to know it for yourself. So read your Bible and know it for yourself and hold your clergy accountable to it. Also practice it yourself. It is the, it is necessary for you to practice what you preach. I am the vine, you are the branches, Jesus says. So abide in Jesus, put into practice what the Bible says. And then don't give in to despair, don't be discouraged. Christ has overcome and he will triumph. And if you stand with him, you will prevail in the end. I look forward to continuing with you next week as we continue unpacking the message of Jude about fighting for the faith next week. God bless.